Well, thank you, Martha, and thank you everyone for gathering here together in prayer. What a spiritual connection I feel with all of you. And you know, it's it's interesting, we were meditating on the biblical theology of the face, and here I am looking upon all your faces, how I wish it could be uh, an encounter in person, in the flesh. Um, but I guess we, we have the next best thing here today. But seriously, thank you. There's a, a deep spiritual communion that we share in our love for Christ and in this apostolate. And so I, you know, I'm here in a, I'm, I know it looks like I'm in a, a prison cell. <laughs> I'm actually not. I'm actually at a beautiful library here in Notre Dame in uh, South Bend, Indiana. And I wanted to share just ever so briefly, you know, yeah, I, I spoke, what was it, two days ago at Princeton to the to the students there. And then yesterday to the students here at, at Notre Dame. And then tomorrow, uh, is tomorrow Sunday, I travel to uh, Atchison, Kansas to speak in Benedictine College. And then a few days later, it'll be in, in Georgia Tech. And I think um, this, I could not have done it without the wonderful help, especially of, of Nora. But you know what? There's a collaboration that's beginning. And this, to my mind, is very uh, emblematic of the type of collaboration that we have as um, just brothers and sisters in Christ who love our Lord, who see this as an opportunity to evangelize. And so I just wanted to put it in that frame, this particular talk. Um, this is a work in progress. And it's a spiritual work. And it's something that happens above all in our prayer. And then from that place moves into works, travels, uh, projects. Um, and I don't know exactly where that's going. And that's part of the great fun of following our Lord. You know, uh, I always say it's like hanging, it's going on a roller coaster ride. And we don't know, hang on for dear life because the Holy Spirit's in control. And we don't know which way is it going to go. And it's bigger than us. And sometimes it fears feels overwhelming. But you know, when we're rooted and grounded in love, when we're putting ourselves before the, the face of Christ again and again, we find the strength to carry on. So with that, I'm going to uh, segue right into um, some slides. And yeah, it's uh, it, we're going to dig into the scriptures a little bit. And I want to um, hopefully connect the dots to our, our Christian lives. So with that, let me try to share my screen here with you. And I hope that this works as I launch into presenter mode. And uh, it was working a moment ago. Let me get a shot. There we go. All right. So um, excuse the professor of biblical Hebrew to bring in some Hebrew words right at the start of this. But this this is how I did my work, right? I really traced the motif of the face. And, you know, there's a curiosity about this word. Um, the word is plural in Hebrew. So the singular word uh, is pane, but the plural word is uh, panim. But it's that plural that ends up being used for what we translate into the singular. So look if, if you look into the dictionary, up, uh, you look up the word face or the Hebrew word that stands behind that, you're going to see this word hanim. And look, it's always plural. That is to say, morphologically speaking, the grammar of it, the form of it, it's plural. And so it may be a little allusion to the fact that, you know, our faces have multiple features and together they convey a singularity, uh, a face. And so it seems appropriate that we have this uh, singular and plural um, togetherness. It reminds me of the word Bible. Do you know the word Biblia is a, is a plural word? It means books, but it's a book at the same time because one author who is God um, stands behind all these books that are written by multiple human authors, even if they're just instrumental causes. But I digress. That's a that's a side point. Look, it's kind of fun to see that the, the word face is a plural, but it's not just the physicality. This word face, it expresses interior attitude. So the face can even mean something figurative. It can refer to the self. Even though the word face is there, what we're really meaning when we say the word sometimes is the entire person. 
or the presence of the person. All right, so that was my little nerdy introduction, but uh, I want to apply it now to some of the instances that we see in the scriptures. So I want to um, set like a kind of a question at the start that will orient our our quest here, our, our Bible word study, if you will, which is, don't you think about this sometimes in life? Like, why does it feel like we're playing hide and go seek with God? You know, it's like, is he, is he visible or is he not? Do I encounter him or am I grasping for him? Um, and then if we are seeking God's face, if we're seeking to see him, how do is it that we actually find him? All right. So I put that in the background um, before, before we survey the biblical canon here. Um, and I also want to do one more fun thing, which is uh, put it in contact, in dialogue with a show you might have seen. It's called The Truman Show. This, is, this came out when I was in high school, so um, I think in the 90s. But it's been said to be um, prophetic um, as far as... Uh, I'm going to retell the story and I'm going to connect it to this light motif of the face. Um, okay, so this is a Jim Carrey movie that you might know. The The premise of the movie is that Truman, and of course you can hear how it sounds like the word true man, it's kind of an allegorical film. This man, played by uh, Jim Carrey here, he doesn't know it, but he's living in one big set in which there are cameras at every street corner, even on his ring, there is a hidden camera behind his mirror. And so everywhere he goes, he's being watched and his life is being transmitted on, on TV. And so one, one fine day, he is surprised by this beauty who is at the same school. And he's just, uh, he's just enraptured by her immediately but she's not part of the script. She's not supposed to be a love interest, but he's in the library one day and he just sees her and he's smitten and he approaches her. And then very briefly, she says to him, we got to go now. If you want to see me, you got to, we got to leave right now. And they go off to a beach, which is supposed to be a private place, right? Away from some of the cameras that are surveilling them. Anyway, that doesn't work because the master uh, director who's sitting in the sky somewhere uh, sends a car um, with her father to whisk her away before they get a chance to divulge too many secrets to the key protagonist, Truman. And so all he goes home with is a keepsake of her, a sweater, um, and a remembrance, a souvenir. Um, but she's gone. She's off the script. She's taken off the set definitively. And so all he can do is um, hope for a reunion. And, you know, um, as the story progresses now, Truman, little by little, is going to find discoveries of a kind of counterfeit world in which he's living in. He doesn't know it, but this, the friends around him are really um, not true friends. They're simply following their script. Um, and he begins to see the signs of certain uh, irregularities that, that prompt him to say, I'm going to step out of the world that I know. Um, but little does he know it, he's been conditioned to have a fear to leave this, this set, which is this island. See, they've inculcated in him a fear of water uh, so that if he might uh, want to travel far away, well, he won't ever do it because he has to kind of man up and face the waves. But um, at the end of the story, he does muster the courage to set sail and find a new life for himself, to find a new world. And so as he as he gets on the boat, the evil Kristoff and the, the, the director in the sky sends a storm his way, hoping that he'll turn around but you know um, who's watching on the other side of the screen is, of course, the, the lovely lady that Truman is, is chasing. And in fact, in the midst of the storm, he pulls out of his pocket this picture of her. 
but he doesn't have a photograph. All he can do is um, stitch together little like cutouts from magazines, you know, an eye from a certain person, a nose from someone else, uh, a, a, a lips and chin from another picture. And he's trying to cobble together a picture of the one his soul once loved. And um, this is what helps him weather the storm. This is what he pulls out of the pocket for inspiration as it's thundering, as it's raining, as he's facing the waves on this one man sailboat. So finally, his boat reaches the ends of the earth. Quite literally, the, the world that he knows, the confines are here at the, uh, the edge of the sea. He bumps into a wall, walks up the stairs, takes a bow and says, I'm signing off to you know, to the people watching at home. At this point, of course, he's realized that he's, he's part of a, of a show. <laughs> And so he exits and the the love of his life is watching and he's elated to go race to meet him. And so um, down she goes to, to encounter um, true man face to face. Okay, so I think you can see how I might be preparing a metaphor here to now apply it with a spiritual life. Like what is it, what if we are on a journey and we can't see Christ face to face in the flesh as we might like. But what if, just what if, we have something to keep us going? We have the face of Christ. We have a kind of sacramental, veiled image, imperfect, partial, dim, right? I'm reminded of that verse that says, now we see dimly as in a mirror, but then face to face. So we're pilgrims. We're on our way. And we, and we await that heaven, which is defined in terms of face-to-face -face encounter. And of course, there it's the glorious, smiling, radiant Lord who's ready to meet us. But for the time being, we, we work with what we've got. We walk by faith and not by sight. Okay, so that's the, the introduction from The Truman Show. But I want you to see that it's not so far removed from what's already part of the patrimony, the inheritance that we have as a, as, a, as a Christian church, there's already this devotion to the holy face. Do you know so much so that in the times of Saint Therese de Lisieux, her name, when she entered into religion, became Saint Teresa of the child Jesus and of the holy face. And so there were even confraternities, with this devotion. And that is, to my mind, really significant that we're not just talking about one author or one Christian's idea. This has kind of been embraced by Mother Church and proposed as a devotion that conduces to holiness as we walk through this valley in the shadow of death. This can be something that uh, is a lamp unto our feet along the way. And so here's this beautiful prayer that is, um, that. Saint Therese de Lisieux gives us, of course, there's a translation. I want to read it. O Jesus, who in thy bitter passion didst become the most abject of men, a man of sorrows, I venerate thy sacred face, whereon there once did shine the beauty and sweetness of the Godhead. But now it has become for me as if it were the face of a leper. Nevertheless, under those disfigured features, I recognize thy infinite love, and I've consumed with the desire to love thee and make thee loved by all men. The tears which well up abundantly in thy sacred eyes appear to me as so many precious pearls that I love to gather up in order to purchase the souls of poor sinners by means of their infinite value. O Jesus, whose adorable face ravishes my heart, I implore thee to fix deep within me thy divine image, and to set me on fire with thy love, that I may be found worthy to come to the contemplation of thy glorious face in heaven. Amen. There is so much here, but I really feel like she has assimilated the biblical theology and the patrimony of the church as a whole, which is lived out liturgically and gosh, 
I'm just, I can't help but thinking about Lent. We veil the face of Christ. We veil the crucifix. We cover the corpus that hangs on the cross and it's unveiled in the Easter vigil as we celebrate Christ's victory um, over death. And we see him in glory at Easter. And so there's this tension, there's this um, itinerary, which is not yet complete until face-to-face -face vision with the glorified, risen, divinized face of Jesus. Okay, so I, I wanted, to, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I want you to know that uh, St. Therese de Lisieux, she wrote a canticle to the holy face. And I'll just the opening lines. Jesus, thy dear and holy face is the bright star that guides my way. The gentle glance so full of grace is my true heaven on earth today. All right, so see this tension between earth and heaven, grace and then glory. Um, there's an, a way in which we're on a journey and we're not all the way home just yet. Even if we have a kind of prefiguration, a present, a, a present share in what's to come, but it's not yet consummated. And this devotion to the holy face is stepping precisely into that tension. All right. Let's get into the biblical theology. Um, I could start with Genesis, but I'm not. I'm going to kind of cheat and start with the end, just so you can see where we're going here. And let's see if I can move my controls here so I can read it myself. It says in Matthew 18, 10, Jesus would say, see that you don't despise one of these little ones, these children, right? For I tell you that in heaven their angels so it seems that there's angels assigned to the, each of them uh, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven so the face is sometimes used to describe that which angels adore right and notice how there's kind of metaphorical language being predicated of god the father remember god the father doesn't become incarnate but this language of seeing the face of God, even the Father of Heaven, this is what angels do. Angels, of course, are spiritual creatures too. Keep that in mind, all right, as we move forward. Um, let's go all the way back now. Now that we've we've kind of seen um, a little bit where the gospel is going to go, I want to prep you um, now more slowly as we move through the canon from the beginning. So you know the story of Adam and Eve they walked with God in the cool of the afternoon. They 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 walked with him face to face. But of course, after the original sin, look at the way in which um, the fallout of the fall, the consequences of sin are described. Um, it's so hard to hear in English, but this word that I've marked in red, you'll never guess what the original word in Hebrew is. Let's just read Genesis 3, 8. It says, and Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the panim, that is quite literally, from the face of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Okay, so they, in their shame, um, react in this way. They hide. They hide themselves such that they might not be seen by that face, the face of God. It's going to be theologically dense as we continue, because in the very next chapter, chapter you have a kind of um, repetition. The, the dynamics that you saw play out with Adam and Eve, they disobey, they, they are alienated from God as a consequence of their sin, such that they're removed from the face of God. They hide themselves from the face of God. Well, so it is with Cain in chapter 4, you know, killing his brother, Abel, he would say to himself, my punishment, banishment, right? My punishment is greater than I can be, can I, than I can bear. Behold, you've driven me today away from the ground and from you and from your face, I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. So he says, Right, And then it continues, and the Lord God said to him, 
Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone who found him should attack him. And Cain went away from the Hanim of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. East of Eden. That's actually the title of a famous uh, novel. Um, but it speaks of our condition. That is, we who live east of Eden in the sense that we're not in the garden paradise what, that we were made for. The whole drama, in other words, of the Bible is set up in this way. How do we get back in to that which we lost? Paradise lost. How shall it be regained? Remember, paradise was cast in terms of face-to-face -face vision. That's precisely what is lost. And Adam and Eve, in a first moment, hide from the face. And so it is that Cain went away from that face. You can see how the the central message is being set up by this parallel structure between Adam and Eve on the one hand, and now Cain um, just after him. Well, so it is as we move into chapter six, and it's the Noah cycle now. Um, Noah lives at a time when corruption is multiplying over the surface of the earth, so much so that God sends a flood because the earth was corrupt in God's sight, or so it is we read in Genesis 6, 11 in English. But you know that that expression in God's sight, more literally or literalistically, is to the face of God. The earth was corrupt to the face of God um, in God's sight is indeed a good a good um a good translation that works in English, but it kind of mutes that language of the face. And so I just want you to kind of pick it back up now that we're delving more deeply into these themes. The earth was filled with violence. Well, what's it what's the Lord to do when um he 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 sends a flood and he renews his covenant with Noah, as you know. But I don't want to go deep into the Noah passage. I want to press forward and, and trace quickly this motif, just so you can see how it's functioning throughout uh, the scriptures. Because um, the story continues, not just with Noah's family, but then we get into Abraham, who, of course, receives great promises. All the nations will be blessed through the seed of Abraham. And so in chapter 17, momentous chapter, um, there are many, there are promises made to Abraham, which of course already speak to the covenant, uh, the, the kingdom which is to come. It's verse six in which it said, kings will come from you, O Abraham. Um, but in verse one, it reads like this. I am God almighty. Walk before me, or better, walk in my face. That is, in the sight of my face, before me. That's what that means. Do you know, I love in Spanish. I'm not sure if we have Spanish speakers among us today. It looks like we do. I see. I see some. Um, walk before me. I love this expression in, in Spanish. They say, de cara. De cara a Dios. Like, face to God. It means before God. Um, and be blameless. Um, that's a kind of unfolding of what it means to walk before me. Walk blamelessly. That, that is, walk in such a way that you don't need to hide from my face. Be, be righteous in the way you live. That I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Okay, so see how this face is quite important? It's not just with Ab Noah or Abraham. Of course, Abraham has Isaac and Isaac has Jacob. Jacob who becomes Israel. He's born Jacob, the one who is seeking after his inheritance from the time of his, even in the womb, he's grabbing at the heel of his big brother that he might kind of by human machinations attain his own happiness. But no, he has to learn to become Israel, the one who wrestles with God, the one who would wrest a blessing from the God in heaven, not here on earth. In other words, not by natural currency, but by supernatural grace might be, might receive that which makes him truly blessed, truly, truly glorious. All right, so read in chapter 32. Jacob called the name of the place, the place where he wrestled with God, Peniel. Do you know what that word means in Hebrew? It comes from two words, Hanim, which is face, 
an El, is like Elohim, you might know is the word for God in Hebrew. So it is called Peniel because I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. I cannot overemphasize this passage. Do you know, this is when um, Israel receives his name. He who contends with God, and he who contends with God becomes a, the micro version of that collective which bears his name. What do you call the people of God in the Old Testament? You call them Israel. Israel, by definition, is that people that is called to be in face-to-face -face relationship with God, the God of Israel. Okay, so there we are in Genesis 20, 32. Of course, as we move forward into the um, Moses cycle in Exodus, this motif is not silenced. It continues. Um, as we as we go into Exodus, remember, this is right after the golden calf, but then uh, that episode, and then um, Moses is called to this encounter. Let me read uh, this passage in 33. Please show me your ways, says Moses, to the Lord God, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation, this nation Israel, is your people. And he said, the Lord God said to Moses, my presence will go with you. That is to say, my face will go with you in the original Hebrew. My presence, good translation, but don't miss the language. My face will go with you and I will give you rest. Moses said, please show me your glory. Remember, the promise was my face will go. And, Je and Moses back to him says, show me. Show me that. But he casts it in terms now of glory, the glorious face, right? So please show me your glory, he asks. And he said, I will. I will make all my goodness pass before you. Notice the synonyms or the different words that are all speaking to one reality, the presence of God, the goodness of God, the, the glory of God. My goodness will pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, um, uh, and I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. I'll show mercy on whom I shall mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face. For man shall not see me and live. That's that same motif we saw in Jacob. See, the idea is God is so transcendent, so glorious, so otherworldly. And we're so creaturely, we're so small, we're so limited. That should we come into the presence of that glory, sinful, imperfect, and limited as we are? We would, we would vanish like the morning dew in the presence of the sun. Okay, so Moses is uh, could well understand this prohibition. You can't see my face. Uh, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me uh, where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock. And I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Can you see how there's a parallel between the glory passing by and then the pronoun I have passed by? In other words, the glory is a stand-in, a proxy for God himself. It's a way of speaking about God who is transcendent to this world and yet imminently present to this world in a mysterious way. I love this tension. Um, then the Lord God says, I will take my hand, I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back. This is the language of an apocalypse, right? An unveiling, a revelation. But my face shall not be seen. It's like you reveal to some extent, but still we're in this space where something is concealed. You see, but my back. In other words, we're still longing for something. It still remains into the future, um, this full unveiling. Okay, so this is really important for understanding now the Psalms that the people of Israel are going to pray for long centuries, and we continue to pray them in the Psalms every day, where we speak in this way. Look at um, Psalm 11, 7, which goes like this. The Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. See how it's kind of um, 
set up as a reward for those who are in a state of righteousness. So it's something future. It's something beyond the horizon, in other words. It's something we're looking forward to. Likewise, Psalm 17 says, As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. So you can see the synonymic parallelism in this verse. See how it's almost saying the same thing twice, but with slightly different words? I shall behold your face. I shall be satisfied. There's a parallel in that. When I awake, right? There's a sense of something future. Notice the future tense. I shall behold. I shall be satisfied. It reminds me of that beatitude, right? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. They shall be satisfied. There's a sense in which something is uh, yet to be, yet to find rest. There's a desire that is not yet um, met its end point in satisfaction. Okay, so we, we're, we're still sleeping and, or we're still of the new day in some respect when we pray this psalm. Okay, Psalm 4, we pray this every week in the Compline. You have put more joy in my heart, O God, than they have when their grain and wine abound. Notice the language here is, there's a creaturely joy in the good things of this earth, you know, that are imaged in the, the wheat fruit or the wine, which is a symbol of great joy and abundance, right? And yet there is an order of joy which is transcendent and it goes beyond what creatures can supply. And that's the fullness of joy. That is what we have in Christ. Okay, that is what we have as our inheritance in, G in Jesus, right? But this psalm goes on to say, or this is another psalm, but the, the same motif, right? You make known to me the path of life. In your face, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So you can see how that, um, the, there's a, there's a, there we see the full cycle. In Eden, we 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 had our original parents had face to face vision. We're still walking through a path, a path that leads to life. But what kind of life? Not just the abundance that creatures can provide, but what the divine presence alone can provide. And it's cast in terms of the face. All right. So this is man's deepest longing. How long, says Psalm 13, will I for, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? See, this question is a sense of, I'm not home yet. I'm, I'm kind of like in this dark tunnel. I can see that it's leading somewhere and it's luminous, but I'm not yet there. And we can we can experience this in our own lives, like what, especially when we're suffering and the way is hard and we and we can. Our, our hearts can uh, find resonance with this psalm that says, how long, Lord? Like, how long this loneliness? How long this stress? How long this grief that I'm carrying? How long just dealing with my own concupiscence, my own weakness, my own imperfection, my own sin? When will I be set free definitively? When will I see you face to face? How long will you hide? Can you see that kind of motif of hide and go seek? Like, I'm still not all the way home. Psalm 31 says this, it says this beautiful prayer. I hear the whispering of many terror on every side as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies, and from my persecutors. Make your face Shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. So you can see how this longing is cast in terms of, I want to be free of the chains that bind me. I want to be um, set free of the shadows in which I'm immersed. And so what's the opposite? What, what am I looking for? For your face to shine on me. Okay, so it's not merely... Um, Get rid of my ailments here, but let me come into your presence. Let me see you. That's the that's the luminous space that I want to inhabit, face-to-face -face vision. 
All right, so I think we can um, see how this motif is picked up in the luminous face of Jesus. Let your luminous face shine on me. Where did that ever happen in the scripture? Well, I, I think it's pretty obvious that the transfiguration uh, fits into that kind of paradigm because you have quite literally a shining face. It says in Matthew's gospel, Jesus was metamorphosized. He was transformed or transfigured before them. That is Peter, James, and John who go up the mountain of transfiguration. And Jesus's face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. Okay. And so the, the, it wasn't just that his face is shining, but it's shining upon his beloved disciples. And they share in this glory. They The glory cloud immerses them. It covers them. It episkiazos them. It overshadows them. As if to say, the, the luminous presence of God is something that they participate in in some way, in some creaturely way. All right. So compare that. I know I'm moving quickly, but I want to kind of capture the totality here. Um, yes, that same face that on Mount Tabor, according to tradition, the Mount of Transfiguration, is glorified. Well, walks up another mountain, right? Mount Calvary, where it's disfigured. Why? Because we reject this glorious king and put him to the cross. Some began to spit on him and cover his face to strike him, saying, prophesy, and they strike the face of Jesus. And so you see it disfigured. And it's this disfigured face that we're contemplating when we look to the shroud. Do you know, I, I, I already mentioned this at the beginning. I'm going to quote it again. First Corinthians 13, 12 says, for now, Paul is speaking, that is, during his earthly life, right before post-mortem glorification. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. See how he's explicating what it means to see in a mirror dimly? That was a metaphorical image. Now he's going to unpack the metaphor. Now we know in part. Then I shall see fully. So see how knowing fully is parallel to face-to-face -face vision? Even as I have been fully known, this is the fullest and most perfect expression of the face. In other words, a face-to-face -face vision is when I am known and when I know. This is the language of interpersonal relationship, interpersonal communion where I am known, the face is not an obstacle to interpersonal communion. It's the vehicle of interpersonal communion. It's the means by which these persons are, are enter into um, a communion of love, where they are known and they, and they, and they know. Okay, so it's a spiritual communion, but it has this incarnational aspect in the face-to-face -face language. All right, so... Speaking of the face-to-face -face communion, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, something I've, I often quote and contemplate my personal life. You know, here, let me just read from St. Paul. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone, of course, he's talking about the Mosaic Covenant, which was written on those two tablets, you know, the Decalogue that was given Moses. Well, if that ministry... It came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze even at Moses' face. Moses isn't God. He's a creature. But Moses came into the presence of God on Mount Sinai, and his face became luminous, so glorious that the Israelites could not gaze at it because such was its glory, which was being brought to an end. In other words, the luminosity of the Old Covenant, though it be great, pales in comparison to the newness of the new. It's like the moon vis-a-vis -vis the sun. The sun is infinitely more bright than is the moon. And so the old was giving way to the new. That's what he preps here in, uh, in, in, as, as he goes on to argue with this a forziori argument, which is to say, all the more will not the ministry of the spirit have even more glory 
See, this is what the old, the Israelites of old did not have. They they had the temple, you know, on, you know, down the street, up a hill in the temple of Jerusalem. The glory, where does it inhabit now? The individual believer who himself or herself is a temple of the spirit. There's more glory in every individual baptized Christian than and even the high priest um, in times of old. They didn't have what new covenant members have. Um, and this is Paul's point, that there's something even greater now. And so a few verses later in that same chapter, he says to his Christian brothers, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being metamorphosized, transformed, transfigured into the same image from glory to glory. That is from one degree of glory to another. How are we being transfigured? How are we being changed into glory uh, and even, uh, even greater glory, the glory of Jesus Christ? By be beholding his, by contemplating with unveiled face. That is to say, with eyes of faith, we're penetrating the mystery. This is what new covenant relationship look, looks like. This is what the palingenesia is. The new creation that Jesus inaugurated by his paschal mystery, by dying and rising. This is victory over the darkness that has um, cast its, its shadows over all creation ever since Adam and Eve. And so in chapter four, Paul writes, for God, who said, fiat lux, right? Let light shine out of darkness. This is the first creation that's alluded to here. But now look how he applies that imagery in a new way. He says, well, the one who said fiat lux in days of old, in the first creation, well, has shown in our hearts new creation by grace to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the fruit that Adam and Eve never tasted, but now is given in Jesus as we enter into face-to-face -face vision. And you'll notice the graphics that I've included here um, as we move from the darkness of Jesus dead in the tomb and then the luminosity of Jesus risen um, on Easter Sunday. That's the first fruits of the new creation in those open eyes. That is a picture of what awaits the whole of creation, the body of Christ, all, all those members who live in communion with him taste in that same glory. And so the new Jerusalem is cast in these terms, the very last chapter of the Bible. And here we've traced the whole canon at this point. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, no creaturely light, no. For the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. They will see his face. That's the new heavens and the new earth. The new Jerusalem that we await is cast in terms of face-to-face -face vision. So I hope some of these, this, um, this biblical, um, this, these, these biblical data points here color and illuminate the way we think about our beatitude, our inheritance. Do you know that beatific vision is cast in precisely these terms? I'm going to now segue into um, a church document that talks about what heaven is and it defines it in words that are now more philosophical, if you like, but it's simply noticing the biblical motif, now explicating it in this way. These souls, these souls in heaven, see the divine essence with an intuitive vision and even face to face. That is to say, without any mediation of any creature. Okay, so now, as we walk through this valley of the of shadow of death, as we as we're on this side of our death, on this side of post mortem glory, um, our vision of God is imperfect. It's not 
um, immediate, but it is mediated through so many creatures, all right? But we're supposed to look through them. We're supposed to use them to attain the a, a communion with God, right? So it is, I think, with a shroud, right? We, we don't look at the shroud and the terminus of our faith, face is not the vehicle. How silly would that be to stop at the sign? Imagine you're driving to, I, I don't know, I'm here in South Bend. Imagine I was trying to get to Chicago. I'm, I'm on the highway. I see the sign to Chicago and I just like park my car. Like there's the sign. No, that would be ridiculous. Like the sign is, is telling me, keep traveling in a few more miles, you'll reach your de destination. Well, so it is that we look through the shroud and, 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 we, and we look to the one whose eyes are open, the one who sits in glory, the one who sees me now, even as I am. And I see him too, but I see dimly as in a mirror because I'm still in my earthly pilgrimage. And though I share in grace, I await the fullness of consummated glory that sits on the other side of judgment, the other side of death. Okay, so I'll quote that, and this I'll end because I know our time is up here. Um, Catechism number 1024 says this about beatific vision, this perfect life with the most holy trinity, this communion of life and love with the trinity is called heaven. Huh, that's what we mean when we say heaven. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about that perfect communion of persons. In other words, the, the, the love between God, Father, and Son manifest in the, the Holy Spirit, that's a family of love. That's a communion of love. But see how now that spills over into the kind of interpersonal communion that he offers his church? The very love of the Trinity is what's given to his creatures. And we call that beatific vision, that a participation in divine life itself. That's what face-to-face -face vision um, is speaking about. All right. Heaven is the ultimate end, the fulfillment of the deepest human longings, the state of supreme definitive happiness. All right. That's where I wanted to get to. That's where I want to close. How am I doing for time? Do I have a couple minutes, Nora? You. Maybe I can yeah. wrap uh, up. Thank okay. you. I, I, uh... All right. Thank you, Martha. Um, I was trying to read, Maureen, I want to close with a with an anecdote that I, I, I would hope would bring this down into our hearts as we enter into Holy Week now. I was just remembering last year being in Manhattan. I spoke at uh, St. Patrick's and there was this movie maker um, who is atheist. He wanted to interview me. And so it was Holy Saturday of last year. And this guy with like flip flops and fast food in his hand and a hockey jersey and disheveled hair comes into the church and uh, completely unaware of what what the church was living in these days, which are like just saturated with pain and love, right? And so I'm there in the church. I'm looking up at the beautiful altar. Um, of course, the tabernacle is empty on Holy Saturday because, well, Jesus died on Good Friday. We're awaiting the 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 homecoming of our of our of our King, but He's descended into Sheol, into the land of the dead. And we're awaiting his his victory march on Easter Sunday. And so I was just contemplating the, the cross. And I'm sure you've heard this before. You know, the, the cross received him alive and handed him over dead. But then he went into burial, right? Then he went to the shroud. The shroud received him dead and handed him over alive. And there I am in the church looking at the altar, which is this stone uh, surface, which is, has the, the cloth on top, you know, and if you go to the Holy Land, if you go to Jerusalem, if you go to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, you'll find an altar, which indeed is uh, robed in, in just this way, and the sacrament is celebrated there, which is appropriate, right? With it, Jesus said, whenever you remember, whenever you do this as a memorial, as a zikaron, as a as a commemoration of me, um, you you remember my death until I come. And so it is that whenever we celebrate the Lord's Supper, whenever we gather at the table, which is robed in a uh, in a shroud-like linen, we we remember his death. 
But of course, what comes to us on that from that table? Holy communion. And the Christ who is alive is received by the believer. And so I want to, I just want to end with this. There's a segue that moves from cross to linen shroud at that table and then passes into the heart and soul of the believer who, who receives the glory of God, the goodness of God, the presence of God, who comes into interpersonal communion and now lives. I mean, the life that we live is the life that we've received from Christ, right? This is what Paul would say. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That is so powerful. So where do we meet the face of Christ? In the face of our brothers in Christ, our brothers and sisters in Christ. It seems to me that's so important as, as we live our Easter devotion, that we are ready to meet our Lord um, in the face of his, you know, whoever has done this to the least of my brethren has done it to me, right? That's Matthew 25. Think of how it, it maps perfectly onto Paul's own experience. Remember how he was persecuting the Christians? He didn't know that he was persecuting the Lord himself until the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute my followers, right? No, no. Why do you persecute me? I was like, what are you talking about? I didn't persecute you. I was persecuting Christians. But Christ identifies himself with those who share in his life, such that he would say, why do you persecute me, Saul? And so that, for me, opens my eyes. It's like the scales fall. The ones that I'm meeting out there in the world, this is Jesus in my midst. And it's not, it's not closed eyes that I see. They're open, you know? When I look to your, I wish I could see you now, right? Because even as I look to my screen, I realize I'm looking at a picture of you. But isn't it true that when you're face to face, I love this with little babies because they can't say a word, but you look into their eyes at face and you understand I am, I am knowing and I am being known. There is something deeply spiritual about looking into the eyes of another. But do we see what is actually there? Do we see that the, that that little baby, if baptized, already shares in the divine life in which he is immersed, in which he is plunged, in which he is baptized? We share in Trinitarian life already, even if that life, that perfection is only inaugurated. It is not yet consummated. That is what we await. That is what Easter is a celebration of, the first fruits of consummated glory in Christ the King. We await now the full harvest when that which is already in him redounds unto his members, the body of Christ, and unto indeed the cosmos itself at the parousia, at the end of time. So listen, I know our time is up. I want um, just to, to say a little prayer of blessing over all of you. Lord Jesus, we thank you for showing us your face. We thank you for the way in which it was disfigured so that we might, you who suffered, might enter into glory. And there, as you open the doors of that heavenly kingdom, you pave a way for us to follow after. And so I ask that you bless my brothers and sisters here who seek your face and those who seek to make it known. Lord, prosper the work of our hands. Help us to know you more deeply in our own lives. Help us to reflect your glory in the way we live charity with our brothers and sisters. And help us to make others who don't know your, your love, those who are still in slavery, in shadows, may we proclaim the glorious victory in, of Christ the King. And so may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.